you know, when this year's theme was announced, I became worried. Not because I don't like the topic. I'm a paterfamilias myself. Uh, it's just that it's not within my area of research. And I have to admit, uh, I've tried to avoid questions relating to the family because I come, you know, as a, as a philosopher, because I come out of the U.S. context. And when you raise family issues, they always lead to two topics, you know, birth control and abortion. Uh, and if you make any statements on those topics, you're going to be typecast one way or the other. So I've, I've done my best to avoid it. So, but for today, I've tried to relate this year's theme to the, the work that I do on war and peace, and I hope you'll find it relevant. Uh, family of nations is a time-honored phrase. I haven't been able to track down when it first appeared. A definition in the Merriam-Webster diction Dictionary the group of nations recognized as having equal status under international law. This definition suggests that family of nations derives from the post-medieval era when modern international law emerged. A book published in 1960, China's entrance into the family of nations, suggests that family of nations is a figurative term originally applied to the Western European states signing the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Echoing the, metaf the metaphorical resonance of a term not to be taken literally, the Oxford Encyclopedic Dictionary of International Law refers to family of nations as an expression, now obsolete, used to describe the community of sovereign states between which the rules of international law apply. Oh, that's from 2009. More recently, however, the term appears in the title of a 2017 publication by Archbishop, now Cardinal, Silvano Tomasi. The, the volume is entitled, The Vatican in the Family of Nations. The book brings together statements to the UN and related international organizations from Tomasi's time as Apostolic Nuncio in Geneva. The title suggests that the Holy See has a distinctive vision of the relations between states, a vision that prioritizes the common good of these states over and against their competing interests. Much as a mater familias would aim first and foremost at safeguarding the moral fiber of the nuclear family placed under her charge. The Holy See thereby acts, and now I quote Tomasi, to facilitate coexistence and cohabitation among the various nations in order to promote a general fraternity among people. Taken in conjunction with the dismissal of the family image as applicable to relations between nations and Cardinal Tomasi's reactualization of the phrase, honoring it as still applicable today, this, this contrast points to a deep-seated convergence in international relations theory perhaps the most fundamental divergence within the discipline itself. This is the difference between those who view the relations between nations as akin to that of a family, on the one hand, and those who think states interact according to the opposing logic of threat, coercion, and force. The stage setting for this divergence appears in two passages from Plato. The familial view is given voice by Socrates in the Gorgias. And now I quote, wise men say that the heavens and the earth, gods and men are bound together by fellowship and friendship and order and temperance and justice. And for this reason, they call the sum of things the ordered universe, my friend, not the world of disorder or riot. End of quote. That's my favorite line in all of Plato. The contrasting view is voiced by Clinias in you know, the di Plato's dialogue, The Laws. Now I quote, the peace of which men talk is no more than a name. In fact, the normal attitude of a city to all other cities is one of undeclared warfare. End of quote. So that's my least favorite line in Plato. Some 20 years ago, perusing the library at Prio, where I had recently joined the research staff, I came across these lines which startled me. It's in a book by Raymond Aron. 
Interstate relations present one original feature which distinguishes them from all other social relations. They take place within the shadow of war. Or, to use a more rigorous expression, relations among states involve, in essence, the alternatives of war and peace. Whereas each state tends to preserve a monopoly on violence for itself, states throughout history, by recognizing each other, have thereby recognized the legitimacy of the wars they wage. Notice how, on this view, relations between states are fundamentally sui generis. The defining feature that sets them apart from all other human relations, such as relations within families, is the constant threat of organized violence. States must prepare for war even when they live in a transitory condition of peace. War is deemed a legitimate practice among them to settle disputes that prove resistant to amic amicable negotiation. And I think that Vladimir Putin is operating out of this framework, which was current 100 years ago. Around the same time that I read these lines by Avon, I began researching what many years later became my book, Thomas Aquinas on War and Peace. Uh, despite his many accomplishments, St. Thomas is usually not counted a theorist of international relations. True, he did briefly develop an account of just war. Yet on the face of it, this is an unoriginal, Augustinian-inspired digression of a mere four pages set within a discussion of charity and its opposing sins. However, in reading Aquinas' commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, I came across a brief statement on international relations that, to my mind, was striking in its originality. The statement appears in a passage apropos of Aristotle's wider treatment of friendship. Upon enumerating the benefits that friendship brings to human life, Aristotle observes that its importance is not confined to the private sphere but extends even more crucially to the public sphere as well. And now I quote Aristotle, polities are held together by friendship. Cities, nations are held together by friendship. Friendship is the glue, as it were, that holds political communities together. In this respect, it is even more important than justice. Thus, legislators, Aristotle adds, are more zealous about friendship than about justice. This is evident from the similarity between friendship and concord. For legislators most of all wish to encourage concord and to expel discord as the enemy of the polity. Interestingly, and this is what caught my eye, whereas Aristotle had referred solely to concord among citizens of the same polity, Aquinas discreetly adds that this condition of friendship could encompass the mutual relations of distinct polities as well. And I quote Aquinas, Aristotle shows how concord is related to friendship among citizens. He notes that political friendship, either between citizens of the same polity or between different polities, seems to be identical with concord. And people usually speak of it in this way, that polities or citizens in concord with one another enjoy mutual friendship. Cities enjoy mutual friendship. Now, I have a, a bit of a discussion about how could have Aquinas come to this view? Was it a Stoic idea? But the Stoics didn't, they thought about the unity of the entire cosmos, but not specifically of the inner relation, the unity of one political community to another. Uh, I also you know, reflect on the, uh, could this have been the idea of the supranational Christian republic? the Christian commonwealth. But I don't think that was the origin of the idea either. Um, <clears throat> because Aquinas thinks of political communities as natural communities. He's not thinking of them as a, as a kind of um, a, a, a bond akin to that which we find in the universal church. At work here in Aquinas' idea, is the fundamental notion that states exemplify a pattern of relations that are analogous to modes of friendship that are found elsewhere in human life. 
within individual political communities, for instance, and within families. In fact, writing within the same commentary, Aquinas, following Aristotle, explains how the reality we term family is constituted by a distinctive set of friendship ties, ties of parents to children, as well as fraternal ties between siblings. I don't have time to delve into the details, although it should be clear that relations between siblings, by reason of their equality, rather than the unequal relations of parents to children, constitutes the best platform for thinking about relations between states. The parental imagery risks moving us in the undesired direction of colonialism. What matters for my analysis is, is the fact that Aquinas takes friendship as a lens from which to view the relations that arise within the full range of human communities, from the community of the family, through the community of the nation, to the community of nations. The tradition of political realism takes the relation of states to be sui generis. It is an imposition of order onto an original condition of anarchy a grouping of impermeable monads that are defined by their latent opposition of the ones to the others. By contrast, for the Platonic and, Aristotel and Aristotelian tradition voiced by Aquinas, independent political communities, what we today call states, exemplify a pattern of relating that is analogous to what is found in families and similar groupings. On this understanding, the term family of nations does not involve a superficial resemblance of nations and nuclear families. That is to say an ultimately misleading equivocation on the word family. Nor by contrast should we think of friendship within and between states as identically of the same type as found in nuclear families. Rightly understood, the resemblance is analogous, not univocal. Ethno-nationalism as exhibited today by invocation, for instance, of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, what they also refer to as the fraternal people, originally of the same stock. This idea is advanced by the Russian leadership as justification both for the denial of Ukrainian statehood and intervention on behalf of its persecuted minority. In, in Eastern Ukraine. All right, so I think this is moving, this is a, working with a univocal conception uh, of friendship. Univocal with, you know, the, the family model. Um, you know, you could multiply the example of this sort of univocal conception. Uh, however, I, don't, I think we should not throw the baby out of the bathwater by denying any continuing, continuing relevance of fraternal friendship to relations between states. On the standard political realist account, friendship, amity, fraternity, I'm using these terms as equivalent. On this account, the friendship between nations is usually relegated to a normative claim about what should be. It does not describe what states are doing. Realists claim a monopoly over this description of what states are doing. They maintain that despite paying lip service to friendship, say in the so-called treaties of amity that have been signed, for example, between the US and Iran, states operate in a shadow land of threat, usually tacit, but sometimes explicit, as today between Russia and the US. Among the more sophisticated orchestrations of the realist view of international relations is the one proposed by Thomas Schelling. Schelling explains how states prefer not to resort to armed force and usually content themselves with threats as a more economical way to achieve the same end. This is the difference between what he calls brute force on the one hand and coercion on the other. It's the difference between overt versus latent violence. Having written myself on the language and ethics of threat making, I've learned a lot from Schelling. His analysis of the different modalities of threats, deterrent and compellent, 
is indeed very nuanced and sheds light on historically significant incidents in international relations, like the Cuban Missile Crisis. However, for our purposes, Schelling often uses examples from family life, parent-child relations especially, in his writings about international affairs. All right, my favorite example is Schelling says to his, his children, if you don't stop horsing around, I'm going to get really angry. And then his son replies, but dad, you're already angry. Meaning once the threat is carried out, it no longer has any potency. Uh, so Schelling has the virtue of recognizing that above the realm of threat, there exists a domain where states interact in the mode of friendship, which Schelling characterizes as peace, stability, quiescence of conflict, trust, faith, and mutual respect. But Schelling cautions, cautions us not to place too much weight on these noble terms and adds that, I quote, where trust and good faith do not exist and cannot be made to by, act, by our acting as though they did, we may wish to solicit advice from the underworld or from ancient despotisms on how to make agreements work when trust and good faith are lacking and there is no legal recourse for breach of conflict. So even though Schelling acknowledges that a better, a more fraternal mode of state interactions exists, the dynamics are taken for granted and are never explored by him, as far as I can see. Absent an, absent an interest in this overworld, analyses based on the underworld predominate and remove all oxygen from the room. Surreptitiously, the underworld becomes the norm, and fraternal relations the exception. A huge vacuum opens, fed by confirmation bias. Since the manipulation of threats, a surgical manipul manipulation, a careful manipulation, is of primary interest, in the end, that is all one notices, with result that the fraternal ways of relating become invisible. And because they are hardly noticed, Fraternity ceases to function as an ideal that can draw us forward. There is no theory in Schelling or writers like him, as far as I can see, there's no theory of the passage from enmity to amity. States that have hostile relations are condemned to remaining in this state, and the only sane strategy is to find effective means of achieving the dominance of at least, or at least a containment of the one vis-a-vis -vis the other. How can we describe the fraternal mode of state-to-state -state interaction, the family mode? Uh, let me note in passing that the promotion of fraternity between nations is one of the three criteria laid out by Alfred Nobel in the testament which established his Peace Prize. I live in the same neighborhood as Geyer Lundestad, the former director of the Noel Nobel Prize. Nobel Institute, which confers the, the annual prize. One day, waiting for the tram, I asked him whether, being a historian of political affairs, he had come across a literature that elucidates the distinctive dynamics of, of fraternity between nations, as highlighted in Nobel's will. Pausing for a moment, Lundestas said, well, not directly, However, there is an abundant literature on international cooperation. Yet, and this is my point in relating the anecdote, cooperation is not the same as fraternity or friendship. Sworn enemies sometimes cooperate in achieving mutually beneficial ends, negotiating ceasefire agreements and, you know, and the like, without there being the least love lost between them. Adversaries lock in prisoners' dilemma can play cooperative games, as Schelling shows, for instance, in his discussion of negotiation and warfare. Friends do cooperate, to be sure, but friends can have few opportunities to cooperate while nonetheless remaining close friends. Thus, friendship and cooperation are not one and the same. So what is friendship? Having more time at my disposal, I would rehearse Aristotle's analysis of friendship as mutually recognized and reciprocated benevolence, a benevolence that finds expression in shared activity, 
a communication or living together, as he calls it. Can nations live together in this way? Aquinas thinks to, seems to think so, as this was his very reason for speaking of a community of independent polities who enjoy amical, 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 amical commerce of mutual benefit and cultural exchange. Aquinas didn't fill in the details. And his message hasn't resonated in contemporary political theory, to say the least, dominated as it is by political realism, although that is beginning to change, as I'll indicate uh, in my conclusion. However, Aquinas's idea has been quietly present beneath the surface in modern political thought via what has earlier been called the Catholic tradition of the law of nations. In fact, the idea of friendship was placed at the heart of a five-volume work entitled, the idea of friendship between nations, was placed at the heart of a five-volume work entitled A Theoretical Treatise on Natural Right Resting on Fact that the Jesuit Luigi Caparelli da Ziglio published in 1843. Well, okay, I couldn't resist again. I brought a copy of the book. This is the French translation of, I think, 1871. It is the very essence of a dry tome, dusty dry tome. It is surprisingly relevant. It's unbelievable. He dives into the details of relations between states, and it's all organized around this idea that states owe one another benevolence. And, he's, and, it's, and he goes into issues like law of the seas, glo what we today call global commons. It's really, really great reading. Um, so I have some words about uh, Caparelli's um, orchestration of this theme. He, he, it's, it's, he, he organizes around the idea of ethnarchy, what he calls an organization of relations between civilized peoples of all parts of the world. Um, and, and, and again, with sort of the, the concept of benevolence, mutually recognized, mutually exercised benevolence as the heart of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of his discussion. Okay, I don't have time to go more deeply into that. Uh, I have a, a brief discussion of where I, I try to make the point that benevolence between nations has to be something more than bonds of friendship between their leaders. And there's a, there's a, a pitfall in thinking that you can establish friendship between nations just, just when the, the leaders bond. And you know, I talk a little bit about Henry Kissinger, who, who tried to orchestrate this, this high level state, you know, leader to leader bonding, uh, and particularly in the Middle East. And, and in large measure, he, what he was trying to do failed because he never paid attention to ways of bringing the, the opposing communities together. And that's what dip, diplomacy is first and foremost about. So you could say he failed in diplomacy. Uh, OK, uh, I don't want to get into Henry Kissinger bashing, but uh, that's the, uh, there's a book written on Kissinger by Martin Indyk, which more or less argues the, the, for the point I've just mentioned. Uh, there's a, an essay I, I mentioned briefly uh, by Jacques Maritain, written in 1930, called The Essence of Internationalization, where Maritain's main point, and he's writing against uh, Marxism, is that people need to bond, not, not just as sort of, you know, as you qua human beings, but it's also fundamentally important that states enter into relationships with one another, friendly relations, uh, because nations are a kind of perfect community in the Aristotelian sense, so we should not bypass this. Um, I have a brief discussion of Pope Francis. Uh, I will uh, just, uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll maybe finish with this quote. Uh, Pope Francis, and this is in Fratelli Tutti, calls on us to develop a new network of international relations. Uh, since there is no way to resolve the serious problems of our world, I'm quoting, if we continue to think only in terms of mutual assistance between individuals and small groups. 
the call to interstate fraternity, he sums up thus. Global society is not the sum total of different countries, but rather the communion that exists among them. An appropriate and authentic openness to the world presupposes the capacity to be open to one's neighbor within a family of nations. Thank you very much.